Wanna play? Two minutes. What's that? Schleeman attack. Schleeman attack? What'd you learn that from, a book? No, my teacher taught me. Oh, your teacher? Well, forget it. Play like you used to, from the gut. Get your pawns rolling on the queen side. Come and get it. Put it out. Josh is playing. See, he didn't teach you how to win. He taught you how not to lose. That's nothing to be proud of. You're playing not to lose, Josh. You've got to risk losing. You've got to risk everything. You've got to go to the edge of defeat. That's where you want to be, boy. On the edge of defeat. But. But what? Play. Never play the board, always the man. You gotta play the man playing the board. Play me. I'm your opponent. You have to beat me, not the board. Beat me. You're not who I have to play. You're playing me now. Come on, beat me. Better? All right. Better, yes. Come on, move. Good. Yeah. All right. Better. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Move. Ooh, yeah. Good, good, good. Move. Yeah, that's it. Ooh, good. Yeah. What's that? Me. So what does a game of chess have to do with immortal combat? Angels and the real world. Say that with me. Immortal combat, angels, and the real world. Immortal combat, angels, and the real world. Before we proceed, um, sometimes in a given moment, <clears throat> We, uh, we, we say things um, we shouldn't say. Um, we say them in private. We say them to our family. And we say them in church. And um, uh, Bob, I apologize. What I said to you, I should have never said. Do you forgive me? Certain things shouldn't have been said that should not have been said. Um, I watch things in this political arena as we head into the election that should never be said. It's, um, it's indicative of the culture in which we live. And um, it's a sad commentary. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not saying whether or not you like the candidates, dislike the candidates, like their policies, don't like their policies. There's just certain things that are decent and indecent. And uh, I don't want it to be a part of my life, and I don't want it to be a part of this church's life. So uh, for all of you, uh, I should not have come back at Bob. So forgive me. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we do live in this world of immortal combat. We see the mortal combat. We don't see the immortal combat. And yet that's where it's won or lost. The battle is won or lost. The war is waged. It's lost there. It's lost for the strengthening of the weak, the bruised and the broken, the backslidden, those that need healing, and those that are lost. And we pray today, Lord, that by the power of the Holy Ghost, um, no battle would be lost. For as Jesus said, it is finished. And uh, this would be a service of victory. On this entire campus, and the church said, so speaking of immortal combat, if you would turn with me to the book of Isaiah, it's page, it's page 784 in your prayer ministries edition. If you have the new Life Application Prayer Ministry Edition, it's uh, 1,000 
94. And if you don't have either of those, you can go to the bookstore after church and pick one up. So this is what we read. <clears throat> he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. Or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Now Isaiah is speaking about the Messiah. Verse 3 is speaking about when he comes. Verse 4 is speaking about his millennial reign. When he sets up his reign on earth. Now our point in addressing these verses is to apprise you that there is a world out there that we don't see. It says when Messiah comes, he won't judge by what he sees. Nor will he make decisions by what he hears. Now here's the reality of it. How do we make decisions? By what we hear. How do we judge? By what we see. That's the mortal world. When you go into court, more instances than not, you know, the defense or whoever it is in the courtroom is presenting things that they've heard, they think they've heard, or they think they have uh, or what they've seen. That's how they render decisions. But what makes the Messiah so different than the world in which we live is he's not judging by what he sees or by what he hears. Because it's not the mortal world that makes the decision, by the way. It's the immortal world. Look at it. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. And um, I need to tell you that I don't have time this morning because of the baptisms to, to work through all of these scriptures. So I would really encourage you to maybe pick up a transcript because at probably one out of every four scriptures is the only is what we're going to look at because I just don't have time to go through them all. So in verses 10 through 18, we're going to look at just one verse. Verse 12. For our struggle, read it with me, is not against flesh and blood. Now, flesh and blood is mortal. So what I was saying to you is there's a mortal world and there's an immortal world. But what controls the mortal world is what takes place in the immortal world. That's exactly what this verse says. Our struggle isn't against the mortal, what you see, our struggle is against rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world. Finish it. And against the spiritual forces of evil. I love the King James wording here. It says the hosts of wickedness. Amen. And where are they? In heavenly realms. So in summary, it's the immortal battle that we need to be concerned about, not the mortal battle. The real war is one in the invisible cage. Listen, you and I have watched a boxing match or a wrestling match or, or a, a, a game, whatever it may be. And at the end we say, that was rigged. There was just no possible way that fighter could have lost that fight. There's just no possible way. He won every round but one. How in the world did the judges say he lost the fight? How in the world did that coach call that play with six seconds left in the game and the team lost? How did that happen? See, the game isn't won on the field. The game was won or lost in the negotiations that take place in the invisible cage. Amen. The combat in the world of the invisible. 
what you and I don't see. That fight was decided long before the boxers entered the ring. That game was decided long before the outcome was on the board. We've all been there. Let me give you a few illustrations, see if I can put it together. You remember the Macy's illustration from last week's proclamation in the Greek? That was an immortal combat. Do you remember the ever-fresh diner illustration with Fox News from last week's proclamation in the Greek? That was immortal combat. So I'll give you one more. My, uh, my sister and brother-in-law uh, joined us for um, lunch last Sunday. And usually when we get together, the grandkids are everywhere. and We really don't have a chance to talk. So it was really nice, Sandy and Jerry. We went and we ate. And it was about 3.30 by the time we got done, got out of church and had our uh, lunch. And for whatever the reason, say that with me. For whatever the reason, say it again. For whatever the reason, I decided to go to Petco. Because I had promised Felix and Oscar. They were the two dogs that um, were neighbors to me when we, where we used to live. And when I left, I promised Felix and Oxer that I would continue to give them bones even though I had moved away. And I remembered at lunch that I had never given them a bone. I didn't buy any. So I'm thinking, I better go to Petco, buy some bones, and, and, and stop by the house and say, Hi, Felix. Hi, Oscar. I'm, I'm around. I didn't forget you. Because believe me, they would not forget. <laughs> I may forget, but those two dogs won't forget. And... Um, I, I pull into this parking lot, and right next to me is a black Cadillac. I didn't think anything about it, but when I, when I exited my own car, I noticed that the window was half down, and there was a lady in the car, and she caught my glaze. So I, I looked at her, she looked at me, I recognized her, and she said, you are my divine appointment. Now, she didn't follow me there. So we walked into Petco with her yappy dog. <laughs> Tried to have a conversation with her dog yapping. I asked her if I could say that. She said I could. So anyway. And for about 35 to 40 minutes, we talked. Think about this. All those parking places. That particular time of the day. She decides to go to Petco. Bruce Sophia decides to get, go to Petco. I park next to her. What are the chances? One in 700 million? Divine appointment. Why is it a divine appointment? Because somewhere in the heavenlies where the immortal battle is fought, Loved ones were praying because so much was at stake. Two more illustrations. Hopefully, uh, I'll put this together for you. Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Herod is persecuting the Christians. In fact, he's incarcerating them. He's putting them in prison. And um, he has taken James, the brother of John, not James, the brother of our Lord, you know, Jesus had a half-brother, James, who was the senior pastor at the church of Jerusalem. This is James and John. So he takes James and puts him in prison and cuts off his head. Now, all of a sudden, his ratings went sky high. The Jews are just loving him to death. So he thinks, that's James. What happens if I incarcerate Peter and take off his head. I mean, this is the chief honcho. This is the one who spoke on the day of Pentecost and thousands were converted. You know, this is the one that Jesus says, I've given you the keys to the heaven. Why? Because he had proclaimed that upon this rock I build my church. You know, this is the spokesman for the church. This is the one whose shadow healed those who were sick. And so he says, man, if I take Peter's life, 
I'm really going to move up in the ratings. So he incarcerates Peter. So Peter was kept in prison, Acts chapter 12, page 1284 and 1828. But the church was what? Boy, you said that earnestly. Let's try it again. But the church was? How are they praying? How are they praying? Earnestly praying. Suddenly. Say that with me. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, follow me. And when they had walked the length of one street, you you remember? Suddenly, there was a host in heaven proclaiming that Messiah was born. Suddenly, it appears that angels suddenly appear and suddenly disappear. The angel left him. So Peter then went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it, exclaiming, Peter is at the door. Now look at their response. Read it with me. Now what's up with that? They were doing what? Earnestly praying. What are they doing? What they didn't do for James. But they realized they had lost one of their key personalities. It's like, you know, we lost one of our first five. How can we do that? And now they're getting ready to lose, you know, the, uh, the Michael Jordan of the team. So they're now earnestly praying, earnestly praying. And Peter shows up and they say, who? We're the same way. Come on. We pray and when we get an answer, we go, ooh, cool. He really did hear my prayer. So look what they said. You're out of your mind. And and when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. So if he has an angel, guess what, Larry? So do you. So do you, Christine. Yeah. We all have an angel. Look at it. But Peter kept on knocking. (laughs) Can't you picture it? You know, he's out there running for his life. He's knocking on the door. Rhoda shows up and and she goes, Peter. She never opens the door. She goes back in. They're conversing. They're arguing about whether or not he really shows up. And Peter goes, yo, I'm here. (laughs) Open the door. And they opened the door and saw him. What are the next three words? And they were astonished. See, here's what Herod didn't understand. This wasn't about mortal combat. It was about immortal combat. The war was fought in the invisible cage of principalities and heavenly realms. Where the arm of God was setting up the pieces of the chessboard to say, check. See, the chessboard is the perfect illustration. Where is the game won? What was bro saying to, to Josh? Listen, play the, don't, don't play the board. What are you doing playing the board? Play, play the man. What are you doing? Don't think this thing through so calculated. Where's your gut? Move from your gut. What a great movie. And by the way, at the very end of the movie, Josh makes it to the finals. This true story, by the way. Josh makes it all the way to the final. And he's playing the best of the best. And he's there and he's got one move. And he's not so sure what move he's going to make. And so he goes back to his training, which was all calculated. Like an equation board. But he hears his brother in the park say, come on, Josh. Don't play the board. Play the man. Play your gut. What's he going to do next? Play your gut. 
And I'm not going to tell you how it ends. What am I saying to you? The game of chess is not won on what you see. It's not won when you see an arm and a hand move the piece. It's won because it's already been won in the invisible cage. The realm that we don't see. That's where the battle's won. There's still another illustration. You know, Job and his friends. They could only judge by what they saw. And they see Job sitting in this ash heap. You lost everything he had. His home, his children, everything, his bank account. He's losing his life, literally his flesh. He's scraping his sores with, with a broken piece of pottery. And, and, and they're looking at him and they're pointing their fingers at him because they could only see the mortal world. They couldn't see the immortal world. They didn't see the negotiations in heaven. They didn't see the combat in heaven. They didn't see God and Satan going head to head. See, that's where that battle was won. It wasn't won here. It was won there. Amen. So I hope you're getting it. You want to win a battle that you're losing? You're never going to win it in the flesh. I don't care how much money you have, what doctor you know. You win the battle. Where nobody sees the war. It's the battlefield of the invisible. That's where it's won. Yes. And the church said. So if you don't get that. Stand with me. Those of you who can. And let's read it. We wrestle not. Come on. Man you moved any slower. You'd stop. I'm giving it all I got here. And you're. I'm thinking, boy, Sophia, you're doing a good job today. Look how quickly they respond. All right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to talk about these forces in high places. And they're called angels. When I was a kid, you can be seated. I just want to make sure you're with me. When I was a kid, my image of an angel was, I guess, what I saw in paintings. In almost all instances, they were um, lovely ladies with blonde hair and blue eyes. Cheryl blew that to smithereens because she came along, had dark hair and dark eyes. I don't know what it is. I guess it, well, whoever was painting these paintings thought that if uh, that people with blonde hair and blue eyes are holier than those who don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. But can I tell you, there's not a female angel in the Bible. Amen. Be nice, Ben. We had a little amen corner on that one, sorry. There really isn't. I, there's, there, there's like a woman in a basket, but she's not, she's not an angel. And uh, then I had one other image of angels. And that's what you see at the garden, where the angel has a sword. But, you know, he has long hair too. What's up with this? Like, why do angels have long hair? How do we know they had long hair? They could have had short hair. I don't know. But anyway, I, I'm not sure what your concept of an angel is, but in this study, we are going to look into the Bible and see what the Bible tells us about angels. We're going to look at their creation. We're going to look at their character. We're going to look at their classification, four C's. And we're going to look at how crucial they are to you and me in this 21st century. Four C's. Creation, character, classification, and crucial to us as creatures made in the image of God. So before we address the four C's, uh, um, I have six definitions that Webster gives us. We don't have time to develop them. Uh, they are in the notes, but theologically, 
uh, a messenger, uh, 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 angel is a messenger of God. It's a supernatural being, either good or bad, to whom are attributed greater than human power and intelligence. Um, it tells us that an angel is a guiding spirit or influence. It's interesting. The, um, the director of WIM Radio and CBTW, changed by the word, he tells me all the time, Anne Marie is my angel. <laughs> Looks like she's sitting on his lap. I'm not so sure, but that's Blaine and his family. And he says, my wife is my angel. And we can use angel in that sense. Somebody that comes alongside of us. Somebody that loves us. Somebody who's guiding light to us. Over the years, I've had a few people tell me that as their pastor. You've been my angel. You have literally led me to know Christ and, and guided me. It's, it's a warm, affectionate term. An angel is also a gold coin that was produced about 1,500, a British gold coin. They were, have been produced in a number of cultures. But um, for those of us who have English heritages, this was a coin done from about 1,500... 23 to 1600, and uh, it has Michael, the archangel, and made, waging war with the dragon. And all I would say to you is if perchance you have this in your um, possession, and you would like to tithe, <laughs> the church would run for the next 20 years and never ever have to worry about a cent, an angel. And then uh, an angel is also considered someone who supports or provides money. If you're a company and you're not for profit and people uh, pray and give, they could be referred to as an angel. This is Webster's definition. And interestingly enough, the radio broadcast, changed by the word, has angels for airwaves. And it's those who pray a short prayer. Monday through Friday, um, for the broadcast, and it helped support, because it was interesting. Remember the guy I told you about that I met at the Parada, the, the um, Dominican restaurant, we're having breakfast, and he's on the other side of the room, and he calls out, are you Pastor Bruce? Because he had recognized my voice, he listened to me on the radio every day. So um, when he got ready to pay his bill, I, I paid his bill, and I said to the owner, listen, don't. Just, it's anonymous. Don't tell him I paid his bill. Just say it's bills covered. So the owner tells them that it's that guy over there that paid your bill, you know. And um, so then he looks at me and he says, you know, I'm embarrassed. I should, be, I should be paying for the pastor's meal, not the pastor paying for my meal. And I thought, you're right, but I didn't tell him that. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, uh, so when it, was, when it was done, I said, you know what, don't worry about it. I'll tell you what you can do. You can become an angel for airways, for change by the word. If you listen to us every day, and the broadcast is a blessing to you, pray for us, and on occasion, give us a financial gift. And we left it at that, so I keep checking the mail. <laughs> so let's look at God's definition. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are not all angels? Come on, read it with me. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Every angel, whether a cherub or a serve, no matter what their rank or position, do you realize all angels' purpose is you? The same. How cool is that? Yeah. Yeah. As they say in New Jersey, very cool. <laughs> Verse 7. Let's go back seven verses. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. Now this sheds some light on the remarks that Peter makes in his first epistle. And this is what he says. Concerning this salvation, say salvation with me, salvation, 
the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now that's a little heavy, but do you see it? What he's saying is this. The prophets would prophesy about the crucifixion and the resurrection. But they couldn't grasp it. Does that make sense? Really, if you're a prophet and you're prophesying that God is going to become a man and he's going to die this horrible death, and then you, you can't fathom that. The apostles couldn't fathom that. and They walked with him. Oh, this is what he meant. Oh, now I understand. You can't grasp that. So the prophets are trying to figure out what in the world they're prophesying. That, by the way, is why we as believers can't give up Good Friday. We can't let the world eat that day up. We should assemble on Good Friday. Amen. It's the holiest day in Christendom. And employers should close early so their employees can go to work. Hey, when I was a kid, I worked for Owens, Illinois. And they shut the plant down from 12 to 3 o'clock. And we went to church, shut the factory down so we could go to church. We've come a long ways, haven't we? Yeah, I don't like where we've come either. Yes. So it was revealed. Oh, look, let me finish. Um, so it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you, the saints. When they spoke of these things that have now been told, uh, told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now look at this. This is the coolest. Even angels, finish it, long to look into these things. What things? Salvation, crucifixion, salvation. Salvation, crucifixion, and resurrection. Why? This is an amazing point. How can you understand what you've not experienced? How can an angel, Doug, understand salvation? They've never been lost. They've never sinned. And the ones who have sinned can't be redeemed because they've sinned in eternity. So there's no repentance for them. So how in the world can an angel understand salvation? How can an, under, uh, 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 an angel understand the crucifixion, and the resurrection. They can't. So guess what? Every day you live your life for Christ, you teach angels. That's what it says. Look. Even the angels long into these things. Wow. As powerful as these angels are, Ephesians 3, 9 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. We don't have time to read it. It tells us that angels are being taught by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You, me, every day, teach angels the manifold wisdom of God. So next week, we're going to look at when angels were created, um, the creation of angels itself, the nature and character of angels, the name of angels, the diet of angels, you know, they eat. Physical attributes and appearances of angels, the position and rank of angels, and why all of that is important to you and me as 21st century believers. So let's close. In 1999... I remember waking up and getting ready to go to school at Norwalk Technical Community College. My mother had just finished her morning prayers. And she said, son, the Holy Spirit told me to let you know that today you will see an angel. I said, yeah, sure. Because I was just in that rebellious state in my life. She said, God will prove his word true. Enjoy the day. I got dressed, caught the bus to the train station, 
waiting for the train, I sat on the same bench I normally sit on. Suddenly, see that word? Suddenly, a tall man with a Middle Eastern complexion approached me. His hair and his beard were white as snow, and it wasn't Dr. Brigades. He said to me, son, do you know that Jesus loves you? And I said, yes. And he continued, are you ready to yield to him? And I said, I, got, I have too many issues to work out in my life. And he replied, okay, son, I want you to know that I am here every day. Let me take down your name and number. So he took down my name and number and a little old black book and said, I will call you. When I got home, I told my mom what I had experienced. And she said, God kept his word. You know he is for real. I took the train every day for the next four months. I never saw him again. However, ever since then, I have been seeking Jesus. My life has not been an easy one. I have had to overcome many hardships, but this I know and have lived. God has my number and knows my name. And that is why I am here today. Keen Hamilton, who is our speaker on Father's Day, overcoming the hardships of life. So do you know him? Have you had an encounter with this God? Has, has there been a time when you've admitted the truth about yourself, your sin separates you from God? So leave the truth about God that He loves you. Committed yourself to His righteousness. And um, a day when you did it. It's not about the church. It's not about the sacrament. It's not about Protestantism, Catholicism, Judaism. It's about God who loves you. Who did this. And in so doing that, when you come, you are embraced to the Father who loves you. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? So for those of you here who have yet to say, Lord, here I am. Jesus called it being born again. And you, you don't know if you're born again. You don't know where you'd spend eternity if you were to pass from this life to the next. You really don't know if you're a Christian. Maybe you've said the words and you've tried to live the life, but something inside of you, something in your gut says, it just isn't there. And why not today? Pray a prayer something like this. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. I, I admit to you that I've done things that are wrong and I am sorry. Forgive me. I acknowledge to you I am a sinner. Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my heart. I give you my life. Be my Lord and Savior. 